Namaskaram. My name is Kishan of Great Ten from Purna Chetra. We are here with yet another exciting podcast with a special guest, Dr. Lakshmi Narsimha. He has completed his MBBS with uh, two gold medals from Madras Medical College with additional qualifications of MD, DM, and MRCP. He is currently a consultant pulmonologist in uh, Manipal Hospitals, Mysuru. and strives to bring high quality pulmonology to patients in tier 2 and tier 3 towns with affordability and empathy let us explore the world of pulmonology with dr lakshmi narsimha namaskar doctor namaskar namaskar kishan thank you um so i was told that i'd be interviewing uh, um pulmonologist but when i was first told that word <laughs> i was like what pul pul what <laughs> I didn't know how to pronounce it, but um, I mean, and then after that, I was able to figure out that it was uh, the study of the lungs. Or, yeah, and um, I think inherently, I'm not uh, as I'm not very interested in biology per se. But when I was told that I'd be interviewing you, inherently, it made me a little more interested in the field of pulmonology, especially and uh, heart. I mean, the lung is. it's a crucial part but you when you read about it and is so huge right? it makes it look very important um i got a lot of doubts and i in the beginning didn't know what pulmonology is so maybe you could uh, tell me what exactly pulmonology is sure very good question to start off with kishan so whenever uh, last uh, few years back i would say before the covid-19 pandemic i would like many people when they would ask me what i do and it's about pulmonology they would give the same reaction pulmo what what's a pulmonology <laughs> then i have to tell like uh, in kannada we say shwasa kosha tagna or i would say the disease of the so i would have to explain now post the covid 19 pandemic it's different oh sir so yeah, pulmonology yeah. and the interest in pulmonology has generally increased it's for a good thing people must know about their lungs right. so i would like to correct you on a small bit pulmonology is the branch of medicine which deals with everything related to the respiratory system hmm. it's not just the lungs so pulmo yes means the lungs but uh, uh, it's starting from your nose to the throat to your sinuses inside the face to your wind pipes what we call as trachea and bronchi to the small wind pipes the bronchioles to the alveoli which is the air sacs inside the lungs where actually the body takes in oxygen and gives out carbon dioxide and so the whole lungs the passage to the lungs and the associated apparatus all the contraptions in our body which control breathing so everything related to a good smooth breathing that comes into pulmonology so if you ask typically what a pulmonologist does they see uh, she or he will uh, see diseases like asthma or allergy hmm. which are mainly not even to do with the lungs but to the upper respiratory system then some disease of the lungs like tuberculosis pneumonia there are infections and covid-19 was also an infection and then sometimes uh, rarely cancer or sometimes interstitial lung diseases which are diseases which uh, destroy and make the lungs thick and fibrosed and also uh, diseases involving the diaphragm which is the muscles which deal with the respiratory system and uh, even sleep comes into play here so because during sleep your breathing needs to be smooth and calm and without any block and many people have what is called a sleep apnea Hmm. where they uh, sometimes try to breathe but they snore and their breath gets blocked right. during sleep so even sleep medicine becomes a part of pulmonology and to see these patients we i mean we sometimes we are physicians wherein we just uh, uh, try to take a good history we examine them give them medicines and all that sometimes we also become surgeons where let's say something is stuck in the wind pipe we actually have to go in and remove it or sometimes we need to do small procedures so pulmonology that way is a all in cause all encompassing field i would say hmm. covering all parts of the respiratory system but uh, so that's about it yes and so you, like you said in the introduction uh, pulmonology became i mean people got aware that's about true. it especially after covid-19 and uh, yes covid-19 played a huge role uh, especially in a lifestyle for about 3 to 4 years and even today it still is i mean people wear masks before that yes, we used yes, to yes. not see many people wearing masks everywhere but now if you get a cold okay i wear a mask i don't want to infect other people and so it has affected our lifestyle in many ways um but you were one of those people who were in the front lines of uh, covid-19 
and you would have had a completely different uh, lifestyle you would have had a completely different uh, experience um i assume that your experiences would have been both thrilling as well as uh, scary thrilling in fact is uh, that um it was a new thing right and especially for the medical field it would have been something that you could experiment on something you could learn about and uh, doing those type of things for uh, is really fun but uh, then it would have been scary because you don't know how it affects patients uh, you don't know what is going to happen uh, so what were your experiences during so th that was a really a life changing experience i'm sure all healthcare professionals and i'm sure whole of humanity was impacted in impacted by covid-19 in uh, more than um, um, more than one way in many ways deeply but as healthcare professionals it really it kind of it uh, tested your as you say all parts of your healthcare training yeah. it tested your patience it tested your skills it tested your knowledge i mean knowledge in sense it was completely out of syllabus yeah. as they say it came out of syllabus and it tested your um, uh stamina because you had to see so many patients and with the wearing a pp suit and so it did uh, and uh, so i would divide it into like uh, maybe couple of phases my experience the first uh, few months what was what we call the first wave in which uh, the virus was a little virulent yes but not we didn't see so many deaths but it was the scare the fear mm -hmm. and i remember like anyone who had any history of travel people would stay away and uh, <coughs> i was someone who actually to be frank i didn't i took my precautions but i didn't shy away from duties and um, also the the number of people were scared and there was a lockdown so there weren't that many patients to be frank i got a lot of time with my family it was a kind of a, a good period to spend time with your family and yeah. all i mean uh, everywhere the economy was taking a, a slow down the incomes were all down but we got good time with the family types and then the real the second wave started where things started getting heating up and a uh, lot of patients coming in like i mean they used to come it really spread like wildfire and too many people became sick mm. and that was the period when um, the really the treatment had not yet was wasn't fully like formalized you knew which medicines to give i mean like uh, there was this remdesivir and there were trials about dexamethasone but uh patients really came in very fast that second wave was uh, it really tested the healthcare capacity and this was some virus which spread fast and make people really sick very fast so that second wave it really tested and uh, there were many nights when i've reached and when i say i i mean the whole team yeah, yeah. it's not only me the whole team with watch with me and the whole healthcare fraternity all of us including starting from my driver to my secretary assistant i really have to thank them for uh, i mean they would have to go longer th for i mean if i stay and give notes till 8 pm then they have to go back home at 10 pm so the nurses all of them all of them hats off to all of them and uh, we had to do two rounds in a day with pp kit maybe half an hour or one hour but they had to day stay a whole shift 6 to 8 hours in a pp kit so that was one grueling period that uh, second wave the third wave was like uh, yes by then everyone had been vaccinated the severity was less you started getting newer treatments and you had this um, oral drugs had come in like uh, molnupiravir paxlovid etc and you also had a um, what do you call an antibody mm. which was working which we gave to plenty of patients in our hospital almost 75 patients so those newer treatments so that exciting part and the promise and finally it's like going to end types so it i would divide it into many phases you asked about a couple of anecdotes like uh, interesting one you will never forget one uh, anecdote was this patient actually uh, my first actual covid patient that itself is a story so uh, i visit uh, two hospitals one of the hospitals i won't take names of hospitals or individuals obviously mm -hmm. but the uh, hospital where i was visiting there was this patient who came in with fever just fever 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 and he initially got admitted under a physician the fever is just not going and then um, uh, yes we did ask the travel history because at that time it was only early march 2020 where yeah, yeah. where all the guidelines were that anyone with history of travel you test so 
he has no history of travel he used to work in uh, uh, that uh, pharma company jubilant generics i mm. mean that uh, so he used to work there but at that time we didn't know that it was significant so fever was continuing then someone suggested we, i mean we'd got an x ray done but it was not very significant then we got the ct scan done and we are like okay this is something different this is something different and uh, i mean some bell started ringing and then uh, we asked the district authorities they have a viral testing laboratory the government and they are like why should we test he just has fever he's from the community he's a local employee and he lives in mysore or nearby so why should we even test him hmm. then we send the ct scans across and told him no ma'am uh, i mean no sir or no ma'am you have to test and we uh, once we requested them and convinced them to finally test middle of the night all of us get calls like uh, sir tell me the history tell me the history what's up what's up how's the patient and all i'm like why are you calling in the middle of the night and then then after a couple of phone calls they say that he's positive and i can still not forget that he is i mean we cannot identify him by his name but p52 is his he was the 52nd patient in mysore district huh. and uh, i i means the team of us diagnosed him and finally he was shifted he's fine now and he got shifted to the yeah. district hospital the communicable disease hospital where he stayed for weeks and it took weeks to become negative but what an adventure that diagnosing that first case was it was really a true medical kind of a thriller where and finally he turned out to be like uh, that cluster or that jubilant generic cluster i'm sure all of our viewers at least in mysore we know that that whole cluster kind of exploded in next few weeks and the coincidence was just a week before that particular case came in i was addressing talks in all sorts of uh, companies i had gone to many companies in nanjangod and they had requested me sir please give us a talk about covid 19 what should we and everywhere i told anyone who comes in contact with travel or something be careful but this somehow spread somewhere from someone to someone and so that was very exciting that one case i have uh, one anecdote of my own so you were telling um, the he was tested positive and so when you say um, in uh, during exams you got negative marking you got positive marking so negative is usually bad positive yes, is yes, usually yes, good yes. and uh, it's the other way around in this exactly the other right. way around so, doctors want a negative result <laughs> uh, yes so when i had gone uh, i had to get tested to be able to travel somewhere and i got uh, my dad was like you are tested negative and i got really scared <laughs> at the time when he said negative and then i was, he, and then he said no no you're fine negative means yeah so uh, i yeah it uh, took over our lifestyles and i mean over uh, the past 4 years now you know like a good amount about this virus but i'm one of those people who uh, still don't doesn't know much i mean i know it affects the lungs you can't taste properly it's viral but i don't know uh, how it affects the lungs why it affects the lungs so those few important things i don't know much about it. sure sure so um, uh, so it basically belongs to covid 19 the virus belongs to a family of viruses called coronavirus hmm. so corona if you tell coronavirus it means a huge family of viruses right. which has been around for millions of years it's not some virus which has emerged like within uh, the last 50 or 100 years so it's been there for many years and most of the time corona viruses are known to cause respiratory infections so it is one of the viruses that group of viruses is one of the viruses which also causes common cold mm. but this particular virus and also there's uh, there was also a minor pandemic about 10 years ago called the sars severe acute respiratory syndrome the sars outbreak mm. which also happened in the happened in the east asia so we know about that such a virus exists and it causes respiratory symptoms but this particular strain in about 2019 and december and because it started in 2019 december that's why it's named covid 19 and if it had just started one month later it would be covid 20 so that that is when a cluster an outbreak was noted as we all know in wuhan in a seafood market i mean seafood but other animals were also sold as meat and cluster of cases people who had visited that market had all fallen sick and that's how it started so and then further research has shown that how this virus is difficult different is that one is it spreads very fast so it spreads through droplets hmm. and so if you just cough let's say you and me are sitting at about 4 feet 3 feet distance so it can travel through the air 
so that's why people got spooked like i really didn't come into close contact with anyone who was sick but still i fell ill so that contact tracing thing which is uh, i mean quite successful with some other viruses started failing a bit with covid 19 when that virus became started sp- especially the second wave the propensity to spread was so much that each one would and people who are not even symptomatic in other viruses sometimes you actually have to be having a cold or a cough and you have to come in close contact touch them or really cough on their face it was not the case completely asymptomatic people also could spread this virus to others mm. so even those who are giving don't know that they are giving those who are getting it also don't know and at a distance of several feet or several meters so that really that is was one difference one difference with this virus the virulence and the uh, how it spreads i would say the propensity to spread secondly is the severity and how it not only affects the lungs of course i'll tell about the lungs in detail but apart from that it has effects on your cognition or memory mm. and people who have had covid-19 find that they have forgetfulness they have difficulty in concentrating difficulty in memory it has effects on your heart it causes your heart to go very fast or very slow and people have had even without a severe covid-19 they have had fast heartbeat or irregular heartbeat for months together and it causes blockages in your blood vessels in your lungs in your heart and it causes other symptoms like muscle ache fatigue and it causes lot of gastrointestinal symptoms like mm. uh, lo- i mean there are people who have had loose stools or upset tummy for weeks together or had constipation and they have had people who had abnormalities in the liver function tests there are some people rarely who have developed even some other kidney side effects renal kidney so it affects all parts of the body coming to the lungs it affects the lungs in many ways in that one for some people let's say one in six Hmm. about 15 to 16% of people it caused severe pneumonia that is their lungs got infected and you get these white patches on your x-ray or ct scan and that's when they become sick they have get to get admitted they need oxygen and they need sometimes a ventilator and icu and these people when they recover they took a long time to recover some of them required oxygen in their home for months together and also there were some people who didn't get really sick but also they started developing cough cold they say before covid my immunity was much better after mm. covid i'm more prone to getting a cough cold so it we can say that it triggered off allergy or yeah. heightened sensitivity you can say so those people who are initially okay with eating an, one ice cream every week having a head bath daily and kind of going out often and getting exposed to dust those people after covid mm. they became so sensitive that a single a small fruit juice or a small ice cream or just having a head bath and just not um, uh, at, um, uh, drying in, your not drying your uh, it fast that itself you would trigger a cold cough and uh, for those who had prior allergies it became worse and uh, for for some people it did trigger off what is called as the lung fibrosis their lungs become a bit fibrosed so this is how it affected the lungs and other organs in many ways and that's why it's a little different from the other viruses though to, to look like it looks like any other corona virus of that corona virus family but uh, when it uh, affected people we found out that it has and still has long lasting impacts hmm. on a uh, lot of people and so we you were talking about the origin of corona virus and so as human beings as a population we just love controversy right uh, we like talking about controversial topics we like like making up our own uh, uh, theories and it's a thing at school level also you make your own theories of what happens to a teacher true, or true, anything true. and um, so a few theories were uh, that it was man made that it came from bats and uh, so many other th- theories um what is your theory or do you think uh, was the origin of you are uh, asking i mean you are getting the wrong person into controversy because <laughs> me or no doctors our training is such that we kind of uh, we steer clear of controversy and right. i mean uh, just joking so to be f- frank i mean the same boat as you the actual origin is officially still under investigation yes. and it is not really been exactly found Uh, due to various reasons uh, so but what we all know that the first cluster hmm. where it was first isolated and uh, that gene itself has matched all the millions of other people who got 
infected later. So the first source was definitely people around that seafood market in Wuhan or people who visited it. There is one theory which says that because that market was selling other animals as well mm -hmm. and one of them was those bats and uh, maybe it spread from bats. The reason is a very related similar virus was found in bats uh, during about the same time and uh, therefore uh, those two were linked. So this virus could have probably come there. I mean this virus is seen in bats and Wuhan seafood market had those bats and probably so that was one theory. Another theory, I mean, all those controversial theories are that it leaked out of a lab or someone and one extremely controversial theory is that someone actually uh, let it go and uh, we really don't know. And uh, it's real, uh, sometimes uh, in cases of, I mean, this kind of viruses, it's really so difficult to trace it back. As I was telling, it spreads so fast. Sometimes I feel uh, it's really difficult to trace it. So... What end of the day, we have learnt lessons from wherever it came. Humanity did learn some lessons and it was a huge impact on humanity. And going forward, we should, uh, I mean, we, uh, use those lessons. It, it may be anyone, as a doctor, as a common citizen, as a researcher who's doing research on viruses, as a public health expert, we can only take lessons. We can just no point getting into controversies again and again because once we've seen such a virus, we have to make sure that as humanity, small outbreaks are going to happen again and again. But outbreaks of this scale, which cripple humanity, that we have to be really careful. And it's all about being together in this. So as humanity, we're all in it and we should make sure that such things are prevented as much as possible. So, I mean, we're talking mainly about COVID-19, but uh, when we look at it, um, the lungs are usually something that is almost always affected. I mean, at least once a month or once every True. three months, you get some common cold or something. And uh, so, I mean, why is it that it is mainly the lungs? I don't have uh, kidney stones every year. So, I mean, why is it mainly the lungs? So, uh, the two, two reasons. One is, main reason is lungs are something which are exposed to the outside world. Hmm. So, the parts of the body which are exposed to the outside world, they are the ones which are going to get affected by anything which is outside. So, that is the main reason. So, when you're inhaling, so they say that uh, every year you take like, oh, I think I read somewhere, it's almost 15 million breaths, like you take. You keep taking breaths, breaths, breaths. So every, so and all that comes to about lakhs or millions of breaths. Hmm. So that is just one year. So each human being in a lifespan, you can just imagine how much she or he breathes. So each time you breathe in, you are at risk of inhaling some particle or something. See, we have a fan and an air cooler, air cooler in the studio. And there must be some dust or some bacteria or some virus sitting there which just comes in. So this is one reason. The second reason is the uh, diseases which affect lungs are usually due to these small virus. Again, we come back to those mm. particles, viruses. And they are things which are like, they are very good at mutating. And once you get it, you feel like your body is protected. But the same virus or some other virus, it just changes itself ever so little. And by the time the season changes, some new virus or a small strain of that yeah, new virus yeah. comes. So one is, we, I mean, the... The organ lungs is exposed to such things and the thing which is coming and most of the time these common colds are not all due to small innocuous viruses. They keep mutating and they keep coming back again and again. And uh, I would say by God's grace or by touch wood that most of them are kind of like mild and don't cause such severe things like COVID. So that's the main reason. So you were talking about uh, you were talking about viruses for a while now, COVID-19, huge viral infection. But I want to ask you the difference between viruses and bacteria because we don't know, we're like, ah, okay, I have this, but what exactly is the difference? Between so them? there are several important differences. The main difference is bacteria are individual organisms. They are single-celled organisms, which I'm sure you've read in your biology classes. And uh, they can survive independently on their own. They don't need to be inside the cell of another animal or a human or a plant, they can survive individually. They can even be in an air on any surface, inside water, inside the ground, on any vegetable, on any fruit or any, they can be on anything and survive individually 
and reproduce on its own. They are capable of taking their own nutrition, reproducing. Sometimes, sometimes some bacteria, they are pathogenic bacteria which infect humans and specifically they target certain organs. Like if that bacteria goes into the lung, we call it pneumonia. Mm. If it's in the um, uh, your intestines or tummy, we call it your um, uh, gastroenteritis. Uh, similarly, so there are some bacteria which affect humans, but predominantly bacteria are like you let us be, we let we'll be alone types. So that's bacteria. Viruses, on the other hand, are completely dependent on a host hmm. and not just inside in a broad way what we say. Inside in the sense they have to be inside the cell. So if, okay. if I say a bacteria is inside you, the bacteria, there are a lot of good bacteria which are just inside you but not they have not entered your cell. Hmm. They must be within your intestinal tract, within your throat, etc. But the virus has to be inside individual cell of your body. So that is one main difference. Viruses cannot survive even for a few minutes or a, I, I mean, uh, you, or a few hours maybe outside anyone's body. They have to be within the cell. That's the one difference. The second difference is uh, that uh, viruses are predominantly, they are like parasites mm. and they are, most of them are, we call it pathogenic, which means that they cause harm and they cause disease. Whereas bacteria, most of them, are most of them are like they humans don't even concern them they are like humans don't even concern them they are on their own a few bacteria several bacteria cause diseases of our body and a few of them are also beneficial to us that we live in a relationship with them which is like mutually beneficial we call it symbiosis i'm sure you've heard mm. of that so that's the main way in which bacteria viruses and bacteria are. so viruses actually don't classify as full living things because they need to be they are packages of your DNA or RNA, which when go inside a cell, hijack and use that cell's material to replicate itself. So uh, it's like any other computer virus. So it is usually a nuisance or a harm. Right. And it cannot be a, become a computer program on its own or I mean, it cannot be a computer on its own. It's just a virus. And so you're talking about uh, how we have uh, good bacteria and it is beneficial for us. And you said most viruses are harmful. What about that small amount of other viruses? Do we have good viruses? Just yes, like there are actually good viruses. Very good question. There are actually good viruses. Uh, they are called bacteriophages. Okay. Those viruses actually uh, kill and destroy and uh, um, they invade other bacteria. So that's why they're called bacteriophages. Mm. So they are useful to man, I mean to humanity in that they are useful in genetic engineering, in making vaccines and in various other. So we have utilized those bacteriophages uh, for the benefit of humanity. So, but they are only a small minority. Mm. So those viruses kill harmful bacteria. Like there are viruses which kill the salmonella bacteria, the diphtheria bacteria, etc. So those viruses can be harnessed by humans to in genetic engineering, in uh, research, in making vaccines, etc. But they are a small minority. By and large, viruses, uh, they infect humans and other animals and even plants and they cause disease. So you are talking about uh, in the development of vaccines also. Um, vaccines play a crucial role in uh, keeping your uh, body healthy. As kids, we take a good amount of shots. Um, so what exactly is a vaccine? What does it do? I'm so happy you asked this question because there is a huge audience out there who are like, uh, I mean, actually, so they are vaccine skeptics right, or right. they are like, um, they are some people are totally anti-vaxxers. Especially so, after COVID-19. Yes, after COVID, the whole vaccine itself has become debatable. Yeah. So just a, a brief word about vaccine. So vaccine basically is a way of stimulating your own body's immune system mm. to fight a pathogen. So to do that, the bacteria or virus is introduced in your body in a small amount, in an inactive form or a killed form or a, only a partial form. So either you take the bacteria or virus, you kill it or you deactivate it in that it's alive but it cannot replicate fast and cannot cause a disease. Or you don't even take the whole bacteria or virus, you just take a part of it. Hmm. That is typically introduced in your body. Most of the vaccines are injections. Some are 
used as drops like your polio vaccine as you know so it is introduced in your body and your body senses that there is something which is coming and i must prepare for it hmm, hmm. and then your body's immune system and it consists of many cells predominantly your b cells and t cells they gear up for when an actual infection may come so you expose it you expose your body to a small amount of uh, harmless bacteria or virus your body's immune system recognize it and after that for many many years it is prepared to fight it when the actual thing comes mm. so that's uh, basically so it's like uh, you can take the example of a military it's not that we are at war daily but yes there are mock drills mock exercises done why are they done so that when the actual enemy arrives the uh, the soldier she or he in the army navy or air force they know how to combat it so the, so it's something like that so you we make sure we are safe but at the same time we are actually exposed to it and so that's how vaccines work and vaccines have i will underline this and i will tell this uh, unequivocally vaccines have saved millions if not billions of lives in the last few decades mm. Uh, people like you or even me have not seen the pre-vaccine era you can probably speak to your parents and my parents my own father yeah. he has had polio during his childhood and okay. he required two surgeries hmm. where he was uh, limping till the age of 17 or 18 years old hmm. and he required two surgeries near his ankle and even now he has that pain what occurred about 60 years ago is polio so and you see people who have scars that was a disease called smallpox and we successfully eradicated it with vaccination and i'm sure even covid-19 without vaccination mm. the fact that we defeated covid-19 as humanity a huge role was played by vaccines and uh, uh, a word about even vaccines and cancer there are some viruses and bacteria especially mm-hmm. viruses which can even cause some cancers okay. so you've heard of cervical cancer that is mm. cancer of the uterus or the womb okay so ladies have a uterus and a womb and the lower most part of it is called a cervix mm. and the cancer which occurs there is predominantly mostly due to a virus called human papilloma virus and credit to our scientists they have come up in the last few years with a vaccine even for that and uh, uh, all adolescents uh, should get vaccinated not even girls only even boys like you should get vaccinated against even those vaccines hmm. so i urge all of you to speak with your pediatrician speak with your parents and get vaccinated for whichever diseases are scary which can cause problems one uh, argument which i'm sure next you'll going to ask so I'll, the argument what anti vaxxers or people who are against vaccine they say is natural infection is better natural infection is better yes natural infection does give a good long lasting immunity there's no doubt about that because it's the full picture vaccine is like the trailer mm-hmm. once yeah, you've yeah. seen the picture you're prepared but a natural infection also can cause it's like a war mm. i mean you are always prepared for a war but you want to avoid a war yeah again i'll come back to that analogy so better you are prepared and keep on your drills rather than when the actual you want to avoid the actual because natural infection i mean probably 7 or 8 out of 10 can get away with a natural infection but what will you answer to the <clears throat> people who are left crippled because of a big severe natural infection like polio or smallpox or uh, diseases for which vaccines are still under development like tuberculosis which i see for which vaccines are getting developed mm. or even covid-19 what would you say to a family member of a person who has lost someone would you say i mean your uh, loved one uh, i mean it's no laughing matter yeah. would, you, would you say your loved one Uh, for the benefit of humanity got exposed to a natural infection i mean i found the i find the argument so yes there are very 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 rarely in minute cases some rare adverse effects to vaccine most of the times like one in a million i would say i mean i mean 99.99% people they just develop a small if it's a jab in your shoulder they just develop a small one day fever and a small um, swelling there apart from that there's no side effect mm. very 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 rarely there are some small adverse effects of vaccine but by and large vaccines are perfectly safe and when you compare a risk versus benefit 
the benefit of vaccine far, 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 far outweighs any risk. So I would strongly urge people to get vaccinated for as many diseases which cause, I mean, major problems like infections or cancer. So right. there's no two ways about that. And so, so um, we're talking about vaccines and how it is almost like a training program for your body. Pro exactly. Um, but can we have, uh, so our body or our lungs especially, they're not always uh, infected with viruses and bacteria. There are also other things that can affect it. Um, so uh, especially even things like allergies, right? Okay. Uh, how do you prevent them? Things like asthma and they're all, uh, um, they're uh, thing hereditary. Very, very good question. Very good question. So the, coming to the other things which affect lungs, which are like the non-infectious things, which you cannot prevent with vaccines or you cannot fight them like viruses or bacteria. Allergy, I'll speak about first. Allergy, asthma, they are all related things. Hmm. It's basically, it's not fully genetic. It's partially genetic. Okay. And it's not genetic in a straightforward way, what we call a Mendelian way. Huh. I'm sure you are in high school now, you must have already learned some basic genetics yeah. and yeah. many of our audience are know. So it's not like, uh, like a Mendelian genetics is like your father or mother have has it, then the child will definitely get it or 50% get it. It's not as straightforward as that. Hmm. There are dozens and dozens and dozens, probably... I think the last count I saw more than 100 genes which interact in many ways and make the person more likely to get asthma or allergy. And even if let's say all of those genes are there in your body, it's not like you are going to develop it. That's where the environment comes in. So it's a relationship between the genes and the environment. Allergy is always. Genes of course are not in your hands but environment definitely is. So the non-infectious things, what can affect from the environment are mainly the dust, hmm. smoke, strong smells, right. and uh, sometimes uh, uh, even things like pets, animals, things at your workplace. So uh, you must know that there are several occupations which involve a lot of dust and smoke. Hmm. So it may be, uh, I get patients who are silkworm and silk factory workers, Starting from they raised the plant which the silkworm eats to they made uh, in Kannada it's called a chandrike. It's basically a frame hmm. where silkworm are kept. They make that and they clean that to people who actually raise the worms and the eggs and people who remove it and people who actually thread it. So a whole industry, people like that, sugar factories, rice mills, stone quarrying and so many occupations are there where you're exposed to day-to-day -day dust. So, the things like that and of course your day-to-day -day pollution, your indoor and outdoor air pollution, all of these things, we must try to mitigate it and try to lessen it both for us and our family members and people around us by all ways possible. So, that is how you kind of prevent allergies and asthma and other things. But yes, there are some people who despite doing all that, they will get sneezing, cold, wheezing or asthma attacks and there is very good medication now. I mean people generally when they think of asthma they feel <sighs> suffocated and wheeze. It's not like really that. That is when you have an attack. Nowadays it's all about prevention and there are very good medicines which are like hardly the dose is very small and you just need to take them like in the form of a couple of sprays and they can prevent your asthma and allergy. Along with that of course what I said, preventing dust, smoke and all mm. that. And your other non-medical things also come into play here. Like uh, you doing uh, pranayama, breathing exercise and uh, keeping your body fit and knowing when to be outdoors and when to be indoors. Too much of indoors is also a bad thing right? because there are some things indoors as well. You call them volatile organic compounds, mm. which are released by many things, things in the room, which have plastic, which have your disinfectants, cleaners, everything releases certain things. And uh, the carpets, what you see, the soft toys, the cushions, they all really have those dust mites and your uh, agarbattis or dhoop sticks and your mosquito repellents. So all of these are indoor things. So try to avoid most of them. If you cannot avoid them, try to be less indoors at that time. And you should also know when, uh, like not to be outdoors. Let's say you live in a highly polluted city. Hmm. Some cities mm -hmm. are more polluted. Yep. 
because they are more populated they have more traffic so and there are certain seasons we know after diwali onset of winter yeah. whole of north india gets into a smog so that is the time not to venture outdoors so when not to go out when not to stay fully indoors those things and generally staying fit for a good immunity the only three things are the main mantra good sleep Hmm. good 8 hours of sleep that old day jadaj of 8 hours 8 hours sleep i strongly go by it and sleep like a baby for those 8 hours no disturbance and uh, the second thing is a good balanced healthy diet eating on time that plays a crucial role in your immune system and the third thing is good exercise hmm. staying physically fit which includes a lot of breathing exercise as well all of these must be followed by everyone and especially people who are prone to such allergies and asthma so those are the various ways in which these other things apart from infections can also be taken care of so you were talking about uh, people who work in the silicon factory came to you and uh, they told you they had problems um now does does it uh, do you have cases where you uh, have uh, silicon factory workers who worked there for 20 years who haven't had a sign of allergy and after the 20 30 years that they worked over there only then do they have signs of allergies yes it commonly when they present that's how it is you feel like they've not had anything for 20 30 years and then they've started it yeah but when you actually start speaking to them and getting to it in detail they do start getting some symptoms hmm. like itching itchy eyes cold uh, stuffy nose uh, itchy throat and some kind of cough and they and it predates the frank asthma or wheezing or copd by many years so it's not like it comes suddenly there are many many years even before full blown symptoms occur they start getting symptoms just that they were too busy doing their work they didn't notice it and when they started getting really sick they came to attention nowadays the awareness has increased so people do come faster and <clears throat> nowadays the protection has also increased even i mean youngsters who start out in that industry they up front itself they wear a mask they make sure their uh, room or warehouse or wherever they do the things have enough ventilation and they try to use uh, organic i mean without chemicals they try to avoid pesticides and chemicals so those things i'm happy about the young generation that way in each uh, i mean we just took an example of hmm. the silk industry yeah, yeah. all industries people are uh, trying to protect themselves at a younger a much younger age and uh, so you were talking about pollution also one more reason just to complete it one more reason could be why it starts at after 20 30 years is their own immune system also probably goes down hmm. after the age of 50 60 and suddenly it yeah. all increases so that's probably one more reason and so you're talking about uh, how pollution can also affect on uh, allergies right um and pollution air quality is a huge problem and i'm not exaggerating right it's very big and especially in big cities and metropolitans um how especially for my generation and the younger generation even the elders um because you work in a hospital hospitals also have some uh, importance in um sharing some uh, concern or uh, to be able to spread awareness so how do we uh, spread awareness and teach children that um about air pollution and its side effects so very very important question and uh... has to be i'll take a little time to answer this question because it has to be done at multiple levels when you said your generation i i was really i mean like it really touched something there because i also have a small daughter and like <clears throat> whenever i think of something the next generation will they be able to see it will they have good air good water i mean a good um, green um, environment uh, something of major concern so <clears throat> it has to be done at every level starting from the individual level to uh, government level to an international level intergovernment level what uh, each of us can do at a very individual level don't think that something what you do here is not going to affect you or something somewhere very far is not going to affect you hmm. you have switches in your room lights and fans switch it off immediately because every light or every fan what you're switching on somewhere coal is getting burnt and what does coal release carbon monoxide carbon dioxide 
gases and various particles. So it starts from really simple things like that. So always, always, always try to reduce. So that's the first, the, the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle. So I'm just going to the first R, reduce. Reduce consumption in all ways possible and uh, try to, it starts from switching, switching off small things like your gas stove or your light or your fan. Don't use things which are not necessary and reuse. Reuse in the sense, try to not, um, I mean, things like plastic. Uh, you use it in your home and you just put it out in the environment. One is the garbage part, like it makes it unclean, but it also, uh, the chemicals in plastics, the organic compounds and all, they pollute the water, they pollute the air mm. for many, many more generations to come. Yeah. So that is one thing. And um, also try to recycle things. And you must do various things to mitigate uh, pollution in, in, within your house as well. Like I told about burning agarbattis or dhoop sticks. Yes, during prayers, many people do it. But make sure that adequate ventilation is there. There is an exhaust fan. There is an exhaust fan in your kitchen. There is an exhaust fan in your somewhere where you do puja and all. And wherever something is burning, try to make sure that smoke is dissipated, dispersed away. So that will control the indoor air quality and try to reduce as much of the soft cushy, what do you call those uh, cushions, your comforters, your soft toys, all those things. Mm. Uh, all of them have fine dust, which is called as house dust mites, which are very allergic. And coming to pets, yes, uh, having pets is a good thing. We are all animal friendly. But if someone is there who is very allergic in your house, might want to reconsider having the pet or if still you cannot get uh, let go of the pet you can at least make sure that you deep clean you vacuum clean every surface where the pet could be even otherwise if you have a lot of carpets cushions keep cleaning them so this is what starts at an individual level inside your house then when you go out to your workplace and workplace measures have to be there so that is where various stakeholders the person who runs the company and the people who are in that industry and the uh, regulatory bodies, they come into play. Adequate ventilation must be there. Everyone, everyone working there was wear a mask. And uh, it, don't think that it happens only in factories. Right. It could be a cashier in a cash counter of a bank. Huh. She or he just keeps counting cash. And people sometimes do come with big wads of cash and... Uh, it's election season, so again, <laughs> big bags of cash are going. So these, uh, all those, um, hopefully less this time, uh, hopefully for all as uh, society, it's good that we have clean elections. So anyway, yeah. all if you are exposed to cash day in and day out, so that, and people who handle old files, librarians, so old books, dusty books. So even, don't, even, don't, those obviously polluting professions are one thing like factories, what I told, but even small professions, which may seem like a nine to five job, but where there are a lot of dust, you have to ensure that people there, uh, they have to ensure and people around them, their employees, their friends, colleagues have to ensure that they wear a mask and they have adequate ventilation and exhaust is there. And then coming to you, uh, vehicular pollution. I mean, we have various options now. You can go electric, yeah. you can go for CNG, you have much, much more less polluting options available and that is at a vehicular or you can even go back to the old fashioned way of bicycling. So, uh, and those things and of course, the uh, people like the governments, they also need to, I mean, make sure that pollution norms are strictly mm -hmm. adhered to and overall we need to reduce our uh, consumption of uh, various um, coal, gas, petrol and those things. That will solve the problem of pollution. And many people ask me about, can I put a humidifier or a filter? One uh, advice, because they ask that, I'll take this opportunity to tell that. So if you're in a house or a workplace where you feel you have to sit for long or be there long and it makes you allergic, you can use a humidifier with a filter, which is called a HEPA filter. So a high efficiency particulate filter. So if that humidifier has that filter, that does help. It it keeps the air correctly humidified. Hmm. Too much humidification is not good. You get fungus and all, but less humidification is also not good. I was talking about viruses which cause cancer, like cervical cancer. Yeah. 
nowadays we see lot of people young people hmm. i mean that's something which shocks me now and then even though i'm quite experienced i see a young person with a report getting cancer at the age of 25 30 35 wow. they don't smoke they don't drink and probably they say the incidence is because of various chemicals which have seeped into our water our air hmm. and we call them volatile organic compounds or organic chemicals that is a huge problem so we have to do everything so things which are obviously polluting and things which are not but which can suddenly affect us so everyone must do their bit so uh, we were talking about um, pollution uh, extra uh, xwardly uh, pollution and uh, the pollution of uh, the outside world but when it comes to pollution of your own body right like things like smoking and uh, it takes place at a very uh, early age even kids of my age uh, they start experimenting with premature smoking or even vaping um, and they don't really know the toll it can take on your body you asked a very pressing question and uh, something which is really close to my heart because yes i have seen kids vaping smoking for the audience who don't know what vaping is it means using e cigarettes which vaporize the <coughs> that liquid in the form of a gas nicotine yeah. and you take it so that's called vaping vaping so vaping and smoking are a huge concern um, smoking causes many 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 bad things it damages your lungs it causes copd mm. almost everyone who smokes ends up getting those changes of copd chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases their lungs are no longer the same yeah. once you've started smoking i say it's like you're already down a slippery slope just get off it at the earliest so that's one thing various other lung diseases like there's this disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis where the lungs get fully fibrosed and that's even more worse than the copd and it makes you prone to all of these infections mm. whatever infections we talked about in the first part of the interview like those viruses bacteria it makes you prone to all of those infections and uh, <coughs> and it also increases your sensitivity you become more allergic you start getting your cough cold or more often and finally the biggest and the most challenging disease with smoking is the cancer hmm. like once you get it it's like it's very difficult even though we are in an age at in which cancer has uh, the cancer cure has made a lot of progress still it's a very bad disease to get and sometimes it's diagnosed when it's in advanced stage believe me you don't want to get it so <laughs> i would say everyone 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 if you are smoking quit it immediately and if you yeah. even thinking about it no question smoking is a big no vaping vaping came about in a big way people thought okay you can reduce smoking and you can cut kind of avoid smoking but still at the same time have some fun vaping hookah all these things but uh, believe me i mean i'll just tell a personal anecdote because um there was one patient which uh, uh, my colleague treated but he shared it with me so i know all the details about that case that patient had he was just at the age of 30 believe me just 30 he was single and uh, he came with such bad lungs that his ct scan showed as if he was smoking three or four packs of cigarettes per day of for the last 30 years Ah, okay. then we went back and he became so sick that he had to be put on the ventilator okay and his lung had those huge what we call bubbles uh, bubbles is a colloquial word we call it bulle or emphysema but his lungs were filled up with those big big bubbles and uh, my friend the colleague who was treating he again and again went back to him asked what do you do have you been doing any smoking no sir i don't smoke i don't smoke and then it was found that he was vaping and doing cannabis so okay. he was doing drugs in the form of inhaled cannabis or marijuana or joints whatever you call yeah. it and and this was not as if he was doing 5 to 10 per day like cigarettes he was doing it he was doing it once a week or like occasionally now and then a vape now and then cannabis and then we went at the literature and we saw images of kids like him i mean 30s very young age uh, hmm. people like him who uh, have done this and believe me the damage is so bad so bad so nowadays people have given a separate name for it vaping related lung disease 
and cannabis related lung disease and they are even more worse than smoking hmm. because there are various reasons which we go on the mechanisms are different so uh, uh, they are even more dangerous than smoking is what i would tell that doesn't mean you should smoke you should neither smoke nor yeah. you should do any of that i strongly because if you just if you have any doubt just people please google lungs of people who have vaped lungs of people who have done cannabis lungs of people who have smoked just uh, i mean i've kept my mobile there by phone just last week i had referred one patient of mine for a lung transplant and uh, it was a smoker the lungs which were damaged were so bad that you could see how bad they were and the fresh lungs are so different so it's a huge damage what it's going to do to your lungs and i strong and plus vaping is also equally addictive Hmm. because vaping contains nicotine and nicotine is the right. one which is addictive and nicotine has harmful effects on your cardiovascular system it's not like you're not going to get a heart effect heart attack if you vape you have still a very good risk of getting that heart attack even if you are going to vape or do any substance abuse i strongly advise any young people who are looking there uh, please 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 do not even think of vaping or smoking or doing any kind of inhaled substance abuse it's a big no Yeah, I've um, I've heard that vaping is dangerous, but I've never heard that it is. No, even it was a shocker for us. Like yeah. the lungs seeing them so bad after vaping, and many many doctors thought that it was not so bad, but then they found out. And there are some countries which have already started banning it. Yeah. So. Yeah, never heard that it was much more dangerous than uh, cigarettes. So that is. Uh, much more I mean, dangerous in the sense, uh, the number of cigarettes which needs to do so much of damage. Probably, if thousand cigarettes. the damage done is done even in 100 sessions of vaping it's like that okay so you know it's much more in yeah. a proportionate way wow and uh, so we're talking about cigarettes and cigarettes can cause a huge amount of lung cancer and uh, you were just talking about uh, one of uh, the patients uh, that were going to have a, a lung transplant yeah uh, you hear about heart transplants you hear about kidney transplants i uh, have never heard about uh, lung transplants previously Uh, can you tell me a bit about how it works? Uh, yes, the awareness about lung transplant is less, I should say, and as even among our pulmonology colleagues, we sometimes see that not all of them are confident or are, um, I mean, they refer patients for lung transplant. I'd like to take this opportunity to say that lung transplant uh, the uh, has been around for more than twenty years actually now, hmm. and uh, in India, it's been the lung transplants are being actively done. so for more than 10 years now and many centers all over india do it and uh, post covid 19 it has saved the lives of so many people the number is in hundreds you won't believe it because some people who got very severe covid 19 who were on complete life support there is a machine called ecmo e c m o hmm. where your lungs fail completely it is basically a form of artificial lungs i'm sure you've heard of dialysis which is artificial kidneys yeah. like that there is something called artificial lungs there were people who needed to be on artificial lungs for weeks together and what saved them was that lung transplant the only the lung transplant story is naturally not always a happy story hmm. because someone actually needs to die for you to get lungs so we have to pay respects to the donors i mean they die in unfortunate circumstances many of them have head injuries or they fall down or they have bleeding in their brain it does happen sometimes but we have to appreciate their family who donate their lungs so once a person is declared brain dead some irreversible injury has happened to the brain stem brain stem is the lowest part of the brain which controls all your basic functions like breathing your heart beat and you are maintaining your blood pressure your temperature The, those very basic functions which without which you won't even exist or breathe so once that part of the brain is dead due to any reason due to a big accident or a fall or hit on the head or just bleeding or stroke once that happens that then that individuals uh, doctor their doctor decides that yes they are probably not going to make it probably mm. it's they're not going to make it the brain is dead mm. and once their brain is dead and it has to be certified by two people then the option is given for that family member to donate and uh, even in that grief where they know that they are going to lose their loved one 
hundreds and thousands of people have taken the decision to donate that their loved ones it may be their spouse their sibling their son their parent their daughter their lungs heart and other organs because unlike the kidney transplant where a living person can give one kidney to another person right. so that's the main difference between a kidney transplant and a lung transplant in kidney transplant the donor is always almost 80 to 90% alive hmm. so it's a living donor who decides to give their kidney to their close blood relative usually and uh, so they also can live with one kidney the recipient the person who receives it but in lungs you cannot donate your lungs and then breathe so it doesn't work like that with one lung your capacity is very less so you cannot just give one lung so it has to be from someone who's not going to make it who's brain dead so the lungs are taken and then a uh, complicated surgery is done where the lungs their connections the breathing tubes the blood vessels the nerves everything are connected and the uh, bad lungs are removed usually more than 95% cases it's a dual lung transplant where both the lungs of one person are taken of course the blood group has to match the uh, the weight the height everything has to match the lung size has to match and once it's a match uh, you get you get literally it's a new breath of life mm. to the patient who i mean once yeah. they get out of the ventilator it's a new breath what they're taking with the new lungs and uh, believe me those success stories are so heartwarming so heartwarming i would actually urge you when later on you get time you can probably do another session with someone who's a transplant um, survivor yeah will get a very good perspective so sometimes when lungs are irrepla- irreparably damaged due to any reason it may be covid 19 it may be interstitial lung disease it may be copd or it may be very bad tuberculosis which have occurred in the past mm-hmm. and doctors say you probably cannot breathe on your own with those own lungs and they get listed on the transplant registry and they get a donor where someone is about to die their brain is dead but their lungs are okay so that is taken a surgery is done and new lungs are given and literally you give them a, give them a new breath of life and by large it's extremely successful the success rate even after 5 to 10 years more than 80% of people after a transplant are still surviving and they're breathing like you and me and it makes a huge difference to their life imagine a life where you cannot go out you oxi- you have to carry an oxygen like a tail always right and imagine a life where you can do everything normally so thanks for giving me this opportunity to tell about lung transplant as well um so we've been talking a lot about um, the health related issues uh, behind pulmonology what pulmonology is but you're a doctor and uh, you have had beautiful uh, experiences and uh, i mean you have helped you have uh, uh, given life you have helped a lot of people uh, survive and um, so this gets me wondering where was the beginning of this path right i mean i uh, talked about or i read about your achievements you had a lot of beautiful achievements um but uh, were you in the beginning interested in this field or was it also because your parents were a little pushy uh, you got into it um very interesting uh, good personal question so um, i would say if if i think about it uh, what pushed me into medicine was firstly primarily my interest in science hmm. because i look at medicine from a scientific point of view it is a medical science of course it's an art as well so medicine is both a science and an art and i should uh, thank my parents in this because they are the ones who gave me the interest in science i still remember my parents uh, they used to buy me all those science books uh, those popular science book whichever i wanted and i want to wanted to get a membership to a library they immediately made me a member and i would read a lot of science books so by the time i was in my high school i knew that i wanted to do something which is very much into science and then secondly the interest came in i would say there was um, this uh, ncert oh, textbook yeah. of um, biology that and my science teachers they played a huge role the my biology teacher the botany zoology teacher they played a huge role the next shift was in 11th and 12th in 11th standard when i started reading about genetics and biology i can still i i don't know if that ncert textbook has changed but it was the first edition of a new curriculum mm-hmm. where genetics and cloning and all was interest and it had a, such a cute picture of those cc kitten 
a cloned uh, kitten so there is a mummy kitten and there is a cloned kitten where the the mother has not given birth to the kitten like uh, uh, normal uh, way it's like the mother itself has been born as a daughter so that picture where a mother kitten and an identical looking daughter kitten is there that really uh, increased my curiosity in uh, this field of uh, i mean like i would say biology genetics and all that so then by the time when i entered 11th or 12th i was sure that i should do something in science but by the time i started finishing uh, 11th or 12th or plus 1 and plus 2 or they call it so puc so then i was sure like i would be something into biology and that's where the third part came in was like biology i could have i, could, I had one career path where i could be more into a biological researcher mm. and uh, getting into a pharmacological field or a botany or zoology or genetics or biomedical that kind of a field or i could be a doctor or uh, so that's where uh, that uh, i'm always kind of someone who likes to speak with people interact with people a bit of an extrovert and likes to uh, always um, social person as you could say and that's where this third thing that okay doctor would probably be a uh, I, i this wasn't so thought about like as you say but when i look back hmm. this is how i was yeah. i mean this is how the journey panned out and that time to be frank uh, the it was um, uh, kind of i felt a, a safe career choice and something which would kind of which will help me serve people and also um, um uh, You, i mean you can say that you've made a difference to people so people always start with uh, i want to serve i want to make a difference to people yes that was there that is always there but all the other factors probably my interest my personality and all those small things where your parents make you inculcate interest in science and some so that tells us the importance of the curriculum and books how it can spark off interest in uh, young minds where they once if they find that their calling is in that path and also they've got the right interest then then they can, then they can follow that uh, path so that was how i decided i'll be getting into mbbs and i wrote the whatever exams were required mm-hmm. these entrance mm-hmm. exams and uh, yeah, it all clicked so you are talk- um, i mean you have a lot of interest in uh, biology uh, from the way you are explaining um and so kids nowadays uh, they find it hard whether to pick uh, pcmb pcmc and maybe even after picking uh, pcmb right you don't know uh, which field like you were talking uh, uh, maybe becoming a zoo uh, zoologist or uh, working in the field of research but finally you wanted to become a doctor because there are many factors um w- so can you tell uh, kids of today uh, what are the few determinant factors that they have to like tick the box and say okay i can become a doctor because i have these few traits because becoming a doctor is not only about knowing how the body works right there's much more to that right exactly 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 so very uh, pertinent question coming from like a person like you who's going to decide yeah what uh, he wants to become so i get this question asked i mean uh, students young students ask me parents of students ask me like um, things have changed like uh but there there was a time when yes becoming a doctor was not very difficult i would say and uh, you could get a seat fairly easily and even after passing mbbs with some difficulty of course there was some kind of uh, you would say uh, good job security and those sort of things you attach with so nowadays i do agree that it's not the case and uh it's the same with all fields like i mean you have a huge expanding population and you have a kind of a, a what do you say uh, sometimes there are only so many jobs only so many people who have that skill set so mm. that matching has to happen so what i would in this background where once upon a time 30 40 years ago if you finish mbbs then itself okay you're a doctor you come out you're going to get patients yeah. you're done then there was a time maybe i would say 25 30 years ago or maybe 20 years ago probably like my generation where uh, you do mbbs and then you do what is called a specialization an md or an ms and then 
okay that much is enough you are a specialist there are only so many specialists wherever you go you can settle you can get a good this thing now it's become like you need to become a super specialist <laughs> and uh, you were referring to my degrees that md and dm both of them stand for doctor of medicine but uh, yes because it was an additional degree Uh, the people who name it named it DM, and uh, so that just means that you have to sub specialize or go into even more depth. And even after that, some people are like they are unsure whether hmm. how fast they can settle and the cost of education. So in this background, what I would like to tell is that definitely those who want to become a doctor, there are and always will be plenty of opportunities. And I will tell you, yes. there are still plenty of opportunities i don't see this field like it's not any more safe to take mbbs definitely not like that because after all it is a profession which requires the human touch so uh, there are various things like ai and all coming up in other fields but this is one profession where there will always be a person to person contact hmm. and there'll be a person who has to speak out and you have to listen to their problem solve their problems it will always be a person to person so there are always going to be human doctors involved and also many new fields are coming up so pulmonology which was a specialty which was a little less now it has become more and yeah. maybe 5 to 10 years down the line due to some reason due to some lifestyle changes your uh, liver or gastroenterology that may be so every specialty has its own scope it's increasing and so scope wise i would strongly suggest that yes there is still scope and will always be scope for doctors so don't shy away just by thinking that scope won't be there coming to what are all the skill sets what you require and uh, when i add about scope i will say that maybe it may not be in the same way maybe three generations before you someone could just open a clinic and just settle down hmm. it, uh, those things change maybe you'll need to work under someone maybe you'll need to choose somewhere close to i mean it may not be possible to right away settle down in a big metro city because naturally big metro cities may be crowded and you may need to select tier 2 or tier 3 cities so that way things may change but doctors will always be required so there's always a scope don't shy away from taking that secondly uh, what kind of skill set do you require i would say the most important skill set what you require is humanity and empathy without hmm. doubt there can be no doctor who is inhumane who is not empathetic towards patients and you cannot listen to patients definitely that is the most important thing and it is as it is it's a good quality in human beings but if you are that person with a human touch you like to listen to people you like to interact with people right. then you're already taking a box secondly yes you need to work hard and you need to be able to work hard for long hours both during your studies and during your uh, profession that is and plus this interest in biology where it's not real it's a little different as you know biology is a little different from physics and maths where it's not completely algorithmic you have to be prepared for those twists and turns you have to be prepared for those natural variations what um, i mean ipl is going on and cricket so the spinners have those natural uh. so you will will get googlies at you and you so you have to be patient so and you have to be rooted in science because medicine after all is a science but there is a bit of art as well attached to it so it's they call it the science and and art so that art is where your your um, your uh, way of speaking and your way of presenting and how you listen so that's the art part and the science part so if you are someone who has all these definitely don't shy away and we need many 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 more young doctors this covid 19 this challenge was probably the vaccine was invented by and the uh, all the groundwork was done by ton, thousands and lakhs of young doctors so we do need young doctors coming in in all fields and when young uh, blood comes in you get fresh ideas mm. new ways of thinking so i would strongly suggest anyone who is interested do take it up just remember that there will be a bit of hard work involved and that old age that thing which i keep getting asked is do you have to mug up lot of things yeah. i'll tell you why i mean there's a uh, yeah, yeah. logical way of answering that as well because when you are a doctor you have to see everything you cannot just 
even if you even if i am a pulmonologist i have to look at everything in the body so that basic that mbbs course where you have to really soak in too much there will be some places where you require some um, memory tricks and mugging up they are shortcuts they don't mean that you are bypassing the concepts you will learn the concept eventually earlier or later but end of the day when a patient is in front of you you cannot tell i'll go back to the concept the thing has to come in your mind immediately so that's why because we have to so much to learn hmm. that is where that little bit of mugging up or that memory or that photographic memory part is there and uh, so if you are okay with a bit of that plus your hard working humane empathetic and your uh, okay to adapt to newer specialties and uh, newer places of practice definitely this profession is not going anywhere it's going to stay we need more young doctors coming in and i encourage everyone to take it up i think uh, more doctors will come especially after uh, in the field of pulmonology like covid 19 will be their motivation <laughs> um so we were talking i mean uh, you were talking about mugging up right and uh, to use a lot of memorization and this gets me wondering um are you ever in your uh, in your clinic in your room uh while you are uh, while you have a patient that comes up and they're like i have these and this uh, symptoms and they you're like oh no i forgot what symptom this is uh, uh, going to affect i have to uh, tell him what uh, i have to prescribe him something what should i do do you ever have to go back to your old textbooks and see uh, yes i have gone back but <laughs> uh thank uh, goodness or uh, i mean thankfully i have not gone back in such a way where the patient is sitting and i forget <laughs> everything so our training is in such a way that uh, whatever the patient presents the basic stuff we know so yes we have to refer but one thing has changed uh in my starting of my practice or my previous generation they would probably go back to their textbooks and see but now we see that textbooks also become outdated mm. so it's not a textbook what i use as much is what uh, online references that there's this um, uh, famous um, app come website which is called up to date which many of doctors use and there are others like it where all the latest evidence so whenever a medical trial is done and a new medicine comes out or a new way of treating a disease or diagnosing a disease comes out within days or weeks of it it gets uploaded by uh, good authors on that so i do refer to it often but uh, yes not in a way that i forget uh, no, not like that thankfully so and uh, uh, good for my patients that uh, <laughs> uh, and books yes sometimes books are right. gold is gold there are some books written uh, even 3 4 decades ago which still hold good yes i have referred to books sometimes but that way of refing has changed not from a physical books mostly i uh, it must be from online references but it goes without saying that every doctor has to keep herself or himself up to date like update with all the latest fields because newer research keeps coming up and what you must have read when you were studying that has changed and that you have to incorporate it into your practice right so um, we were to- so we're talking about uh, how you have to go back to books once in a while or you have to use um, so these types of experiences is a little funny or maybe even uh, some very special experiences that you have had as a doctor in the surgical room or as a consultant special special experiences yeah, there are few special experiences maybe one or two funny and one or two yeah. like um, one uh, really uh, surgical room you told so one experience comes to me so there is this procedure called a uh, whole lung lavage where there is a disease where called alveolar proteinosis where your lungs get filled with uh, protein and fat mm. so it occurs because your body is not able to clear it naturally and uh, it gets keeps getting accumulated and after weeks or months of accumulation the patient is completely out of breath their oxygen saturation i'm sure you are aware there's something called oximeter right where yeah. you put it on your finger and you check the saturation above 90 is pass less than 90 is like you're not good types so uh, that patient had it in 70 or something mm. it was so bad so and such a patient needed help so we had to do it and uh, it was uh, i have done this before i have been a part of the team which has done it before in various other centers which were a uh, little more uh, like big centers 
like where I was doing my MD and DM in PGI Chandigarh or in Ames, those kind of places I've done. But in Mysore, in a small town, I was initially apprehensive whether I could do it. Then somehow I got the courage and I thought we should do it. And the patients also gave me the confidence. So they told, uh, so whatever it is, we are okay with the outcome, please do it. And then uh, when they also gave me the confidence, I took a team and uh, leading the team, going into the OT and when doing it, actually when you are washing the lungs, you literally push in salt water or saline mm. and actually clear the lungs. And like when you're pushing in, it's clear water and when it comes out, it's milky white. It's like that, uh, it's literally like a thick milk, what comes out. And liters and liters and liters, 20 liters of cleaning the lung. And during that procedure, that saturation is going to 40, 50, 60. And it was like, uh, it did give me those things. But the outcome, once the procedure is over, the patient is off oxygen within a couple of days and he is walking home and the family is so happy and like they are literally falling at your feet and say, please, 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 no, we've just... So the, the outcome was so gratifying, so gratifying. The procedure was so tough. I, I've done it before, but on my own, leading the team, doing it in a small town. And uh, that's where... It was so satisfying and uh, that patient keeps, he, he's still in contact and uh, he keeps uh, coming now and then and just keeps saying thanks and uh, it's so satisfying that uh, sometimes that is what as doctors, that keeps you going on. Hmm. So that was one experience. Second funny experience, there was this one patient where uh, uh, he had cough and he consulted someone, got an x-ray, there was some shadow. And he got a CT scan done and they are saying like some tumor is there in your windpipe. And that patient is complete. Everyone in the family is crying. Uh. Like what is the tumor? Then we had to put a camera inside his uh, lungs, his windpipes. It is called bronchoscopy. It's something what we do routinely as pulmonologists. Yeah. And they were like, I, uh, I mean like put the camera in, put the camera in. I'm expecting a tumor to come. And I see something like green and round and... Uh, I'm like, this doesn't look like a tumor, tumor ala alba, and I'm asking my assistant what it is. So anyway, we'll remove it. Karke, we removed it. Then we removed it and we took it in our hands. It was a green pea. Okay. Batani, <laughs> as they say, yeah, mutter. Green pea. A piece of green pea was stuck in his uh, windpipe. Uh. And uh, I came out of the operating room and uh, I showed it to the relatives like, Sir, what is this? This is what was there inside your husband's and your father's <laughs> lungs. And sir, this was it. There's no tumor. And they, I mean, like they had tears of joy and they were like, oh, they had literally like thought the tumor was there and their loved one was going to die in a matter of few months. And then when the patient became awake after the sedation went off, I asked him, how did this go in? He said, uh, sir, now I remember how it went in. Just a couple of days before the cough started, he was having pulao, vegetable, peace pulao and uh, his wife had, uh, his daughter had lovingly prepared and he had that pulao and he, while eating it, he choked. He choked a bit and one, but he, that time he coughed for a bit and then he was fine. From yeah. the next day, that cough started increasing. So, and then he got everything done. And so the, that was one uh, happy ending. And uh, even now, when I see that patients, I asked, um, like, what did you eat, sir? Pull out in the Did you have pull out today? And he was like, sir, I'm never going to have pull out. <laughs> Rest of my life, never, ever, ever. Uh. So that always, when I see him, even now, I asked him, what did you eat? Did you eat pull out? It's a joke between us. So he is like, sir, that is one thing which I'm not ever going to touch. <laughs> and his wife and his daughter also. That was one uh, funny incident. And there were many like this. So And one, uh, one more happy thing is like, I treated a patient and I sent him. I was happy. He recovered. And then uh, he's, uh, he came for follow-up. He's fine. Uh, it was actually, I think, an accident case where he had fractured a lot of ribs. He was in much pain. Mm. We treated him, the rib fractures. To be frank, really, we didn't do miracles compared to the previous cases where we actually did something. I was like, okay, he's happy. He's uh, telling me silently, sir, please come to the car. Please come to the car. I was like, why should I come to his car? And then I said, I'll see a couple of more patients, end of my OPD, and then I'll come. Uh. Then he takes me to my his car, and he says, wait, wait, I have something to show you. And he opens his car boot, the dickey, 
and there are like uh, kilograms and quintals of vegetables and coconuts, everything he's brought. <laughs> And I'm like, who have you brought this for? Sir, you saved my life so much. And I'm sure all doctors have had such experiences. But this was something I still can't believe. I did something so little for him and relieved his pain and the thankfulness which, which, which patients come. So these are the things which, which actually which keep doctors going. Yeah. So thanks for asking that. <laughs> and so you're talking about uh, bronchioscopy. Um, we, we've heard about uh, things like colonoscopies and all that. Bronchoscopy is bronchoscopy. Ah, bronchoscopy. Sorry, uh, bronchoscopy is something routine. People uh, come. Do they know that uh, you should do it around? So bronchoscopy is a routine procedure. It's basically a video endoscopy of your windpipe. Hmm. So you've heard about endoscopy and colonoscopy, yeah. where a thin, long, small, thin pipe, a wire-like thin, with a camera at an end, it's inserted. So bronchoscopy is similar to that. So, if you suspect something within the lungs and the airways, the, the bronchoscopy is something very similar where a small thin pipe tube is introduced through the nose and it goes in through your windpipe and the patient is usually awake or we give them a bit of uh, sleeping medicine so that they are just awake and but they know what's going on. It and goes it's very through your nose. Yeah, because I, through the nose is your natural breathing passage. So, yeah, but uh, COVID-19 tests, I mean, it goes a little bit and you don't want it. How do you complete? So, there is uh, what we call a local anesthesia which is given. Ah, so, okay. we make sure certain sprays are given, yeah, yeah. certain nebulizations are given and uh, those and sometimes we give a medicine through the throat as well. So, all that is given so that without any pain. So, when I say any scopy, endoscopy, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, it's all done with adequate anesthesia, local anesthesia. So, we prepare the patient and then put it through and it passes in easily and then we, with that camera, we go into all the parts of the lung, both lungs, the right lung and the left lung and we look and if we find something, we take samples there and sometimes it's a therapeutic where you are doing that bronchoscopy to, as I said, to remove something or to clear the passage. Sometimes it's only for diagnosis, mm. you see if it's a tumor, take samples and sometimes it is to actually, bronchoscopy itself is the treatment. So, for the person who had swallowed that uh, pee, pee, so the bronchoscopy was the treatment. He asked me, what more is the treatment? I said, treatment is done, go home. Nothing else required. So, so that's a simple, it's a simple procedure. It's a simple procedure. I mean, for colonoscopy, people know that around 50, 40 years old, you do a routine checkup. Um, no, bronchoscopy is not done routinely like that. Okay. Because you have various non-invasive ways, like an x-ray or a CT scan, hmm. which are done as screening. So, you don't need to get bronchoscopy routinely. It okay. is only done when it is indicated by the physician. It's not like it's done routinely by pulmonologists, but for normal people, they don't need to undergo it like routinely. And uh, so, we were speaking about experiences, funny experiences that you've had. Um, but then there are also times where uh, you have to make, because uh, the medical industry has a lot of life and death situations, right? And you have to make split second decisions. Um, and at times, emotions can override you, emotions can take over uh, what, you're do, uh, what you're doing and how you're going to help the person. So, logic can be overridden by emotions and how do you stay grounded in those moments? Very good question. One is, probably I would say the way we are trained, the way medical training goes through, training plays a huge part in it. So, if you are trained in a place where you have, you start seeing such situations, in the early part of your career as well as a student. Of course, someone is always there along with you, but mm. you see such situations that that makes you a little, your decisions are then removed from your emotions. You know that these things happen, but still you have to go by the decision in the best interest of what has to um, be done. So that is one thing, the training part of it. Secondly, you also need something. Sometimes you need some things which are, uh, interest uh, apart from medicine, so uh, to keep your sense of balance. So some doctors indulge in sports, some doctors have other hobbies, so some doctors um, they have, um, I mean they do various kinds of other social work etc. So those kind of things, they give you a purpose in life other than medicine. So if you if you're just completely into medicine day in day out, that's when you are completely emotionally into each patient, and it and then sometimes it's not good for the patient as well. When you are deciding on their, 
I mean, you're, you, when you're making that decision, hmm. and sometimes they tell, so you only are suggested what is the best course of action. I mean, ideally, we should not be the ones to decide. But yes, yeah. every time we have to make decisions which are in the best interest, those emotions have to be taken away. If you're fully day in and day out into the field, then it becomes difficult. So you need something where you know that your life has to go on, even without the profession, your life has to go on, things have to go on. So for that, you need some interest outside medicine as well. And most people do have it. So for me, it's like uh, probably I do some um, um, social work. I'm uh, associated with certain organizations. So with that, and I time I spend time with my family. I take walks. I, uh, I mean, I, I used to one time play sports, but now I don't have that much time. Yeah. So those kinds of things. And uh, so that is one thing. And the third thing is many doctors, uh, probably including me, we have uh, some a bit of, we are spiritual, as you say. Mm. So um, I was just watching one of your previous uh, podcasts uh, where, where you were done with uh, Bala Swamiji yes. of Ganbadi Sachan Vashama. Uh. And he was talking well about the spiritual part of it. So we have to understand as doctors that uh, you call it science, you call it nature, you call it spirit, you call it uh, some, there is something, some power around you, uh, which is beyond all of this. So we are just minimum, if you take it from a scientific point of view, that's where I said science. You know about the universe, you know about the Big Bang Theory, yeah. you know how big the universe is. You have your Hubble telescope and now you have the James, James Webb Hubble, Sphere yeah. telescope. So um, we are nothing in the microscosm of uh, 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 we are uh, the universe, we are nothing, nothing, nothing. So once we know that we are hardly here, even on earth we are nothing, human beings themselves are nothing and even in humanity with a population of probably what now, 8 billion or something or 1.5 billion Indians, we are just someone. That is what I call a spirituality. So you look at it from science point of view, it's there. If you look at it from nature's point of view, yes, Science will progress, nature will progress, but it is kind of, you cannot, there will be always something where what next, what caused this, that thing is there. And that is where uh, people who are like spiritual or people who are religious, they give it. So end of the day, that is where those two streams come in very, so mm. all the major scientists or all the great doctors, they, if you see, they are uh, like kind of, that is how they keep themselves doing their work without the emotion because they know that beyond all of this, there is something else. So if you get emotional and get attached to that day, that patient, that thing, of course, you have to, when you're there with them on that day, you're everything for them. But when taking decisions, just you have to keep that balance. So these are probably the things what I would say. One is uh, having something outside the field of medicine. Secondly, being spiritual and understanding that after all, all of this, you're, you're doing your duty, but sometimes things don't turn out. There are powers behind it, which are like many more, uh, mm. uh, which are not understandable, yeah. which are not uh, fathomable from you. So those are the things which kind of makes me um, keep that. And the training, of course, mm. we are trained in such a way to keep calm always. <laughs> yeah, I love how you said... Uh... I mean, you're so small compared to the universe, the planets, and even within humanity. If there is one profession which makes you realize that, it is the medical profession. Uh -huh. The moment you may, in if, in physics, you may take 40 years to realize that. Yeah. In chemistry, you may take 30 years to realize that. In zoology or botany, you may take 10 years. On medicine, in day one, you realize that. <laughs> you are nothing. There are bigger places at work. Because the moment you start seeing, because what do you say to a patient like, who are, uh, who say, I've done nothing, I've neither smoked nor drink, nor I keep a clean life, I've followed everything. And uh, just that I developed this rare disease. What is your answer to that? Yeah. So there are many things which are not really in our hands. So, and uh, I just want to add like a small thing to that thing. I, um, like we're so small compared to uh, the planets and humanity, but also at the same time, we're so big when it comes to atoms and molecules and at the quantum level. So when you look at it both ways, you're somewhat neutral on that perspective and you can stay in the center of a seesaw without yes. following one side or following the other. Correct. Yes. That's one way of looking at it. Yes, yes, yes. And um, Orders of magnitude, as I say, we are somewhere in between <laughs> yeah. the both things.
and uh, so you, we were talking about um, how we have a lot of life in that situations right and there are moments where uh, some situations can go wrong um, and you have to break it to the family members right um, and that must be super hard for you um, how do you go as per uh, giving the news do you ever have to um, take care or do you have to uh, maybe comfort the uh, yes, family members that's, that's it's very commonly it is us as doctors who break the news many times it may be bad news of their disease or their death so and uh, again training does play a part we are uh, trained uh, uh, nowadays it's part of the curriculum as well breaking right. bad news earlier on it was not part of the curriculum but still we saw how others were doing it we were around us our seniors and then we learned and uh, so um, it is tough i wouldn't say it's easy any day but uh, you have to understand again what previous the answer to the previous question when you understand that you have done your duty and you have um, done whatever is best for the patients uh, you need not feel guilty while breaking news done your duty you have to break it in a this uh, way possible where they understand it and secondly also you have to kind of comfort them and uh, make them understand that why this happened the family members grief is the family members grief there may be hundreds of people comforting them but they have to go through that grief so you have to kind of let's say someone was suffering for several months with a very painstaking end stage disease where there was no chance of recovery mm. and they were just undergoing literally torture on a day to day basis with tubes inside we kind of tell them that good that at least she or he has been liberated of that and uh, there's an end to the suffering so that is one way we put it so that that even they understand that's actually the easier part of breaking news when someone has been suffering it's uh, it's still tough but it's but sometimes it's someone who's very young and some they had many years of life of, of ahead of them and there's no reason why they should be taken away from us but it does happen yeah so sometimes we just have to be there with them you just break the news you just kind of you cannot say much because it was so tough on them they've done the best and they've done you've done your best so sometimes it's very tough you just have to just be there so sometimes just being there and uh, we just don't speak sometimes we just uh, i sometimes just make sure that everything is done and then the body is handed over till then i'm just there sometimes just that being there is kind of comforting for people so sometimes you can express it in words and comfort them as i said you can rationalize it or whatever but sometimes you just cannot and they just have to go through the grief and uh, sometimes they come back after weeks or months some people so they come and ask uh, could we have done something differently could they have been saved did i because they do feel the guilt as yeah, humans yeah. even even you are a human so we do feel guilt if we lose someone could we have done something hmm. so then again we require to i mean we say tell them that what had to happen had to happen and uh, that's where we kind of uh, sometimes the answers become philosophical or spiritual but that's uh, as humans what else can we do yeah the way you're explaining it is uh, i mean it really puts some concern into um we are not really uh, we don't think about how important uh, people are until we lose it and it's for a lot of things right uh, even if you lose uh, maybe your foot you will uh, be grateful for it so if you lose a whole family member you, i mean uh, it's uh, tremendous on your feelings and you should really uh, i mean before that you should cherish the moments you shouldn't True. after death you should be like ah i should have cherished that moment so um, yes yeah. that uh, live your life and spend it with them when you're there that's yeah. true that helps a lot oh is a uh, heavy this uh, few topics that we've been speaking about and um, i'm hoping that uh, my next question might lighten the mood a little bit and i've been willing to use this word hmm. uh, for a while now and um, Uh, numino ultra microscopic silico volcano coniosis <laughs> what numino <laughs> numino ultra, ultra microscopic, microscopic. Um, uh, silico volcano uh, coniosis oh, 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 have you ever used this uh, in real I, life i have heard this word i've heard this word 
I have heard this word in quizzes actually. <laughs> it's probably uh, it is one of the contenders for the longest words in the Oxford English dictionary. Yeah, yeah. I guess I've heard it in that context. And uh, I mean, it's actually a self-explanatory word. Pneumono, ultra, micro, volcano, silicosis. Just pneumono means lungs. Ultra, micro means ultra microscopic particles. Silico means silica dust. Hmm. And volcano means it's from a volcanic ash. Okay. So. Uh, I think from what I've read and heard about it, people who are mining in volcanic ash, there are a lot of minerals in volcanic ash and there are people who mine it for a reason or people who are accidentally exposed to it. Like they were doing some mining or somewhere near a volcano and the ash fell. So that prolonged exposure to that, it goes into your lungs and it causes silicosis. Hmm. We doctors just call it silicosis. Silicosis commonly occurs in India in stone crushers. Yeah. So, but it, this is one uh, extremely, what do you say, um, extravagant, uh, bombastic way of getting that silicosis where you're near a volcanic eruption and uh, you're mining in that volcanic ash and that kind of comes in. But uh, is it still the record holder for the longest word? Because when I, I uh. remember this and it was probably, uh, I was a quizzer once upon a time. Uh. So, it was... Um, I mean, do check it I out. I don't exactly I, know. Yeah. But, but it is, it does hold the record for being the longest word in the Oxford English Dictionary. And yeah. uh, You're saying that you were a quizzer. Do you want to try and spell it? <laughs> spell it. Uh. Uh. Pneumono, P-N-E-U-M-O-N-O, Ultra Micro, U-L-T-R-A-M-I-C-R-O. Ultra, what then? Ultra Micro, what then? Ultra Microscopic. Microscopic, S-C-O-P-I-C. Uh, silico, silico, S L S I L I C O, uh, volcano, V O L C N O, coniosis, C O N I O S I S. Actually, ah. it's not such a big word to spell ah, because yeah. it's formed of seven or eight different right. parts. Spelling it, it's not so difficult uh, than remembering it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question to lighten up the mood <laughs> after a heavy, long philosophical yeah, yeah, yeah. discussion. So. Yeah, beautifully explained and uh, really, I mean, got to learn. I'll throw a quiz question at you. It's okay. okay. <laughs> to, which is uh, India's only volcano, active volcano? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, what? I am a bad quizzer. Um, <laughs> you threw me a quiz question at me and this is something which all, I mean, everyone in, it comes in geography, you know, geography. You geography. Not ready geography. I don't know, we should leave this uh, question for the viewers. <laughs> You're escaping this call. Escape. <laughs> Have you been to the Andamans? Uh, no, never been. You've never been to Andamans. No. You should explore Andamans, geology, geography. So there's an island called Barren Island. Hmm. So uh, viewers can correct me. I think that's the Barren Island and uh, Mount Barren. Hmm. So that's India's only active volcano. Hmm. India has one volcano which you've not visited and I think you should do. So uh, don't get any mono volcano <laughs> by going there. Wear a mask and go. Yeah. I'll uh, use this question with uh, other friends. Yes. yes. Now that it's leaked out in the media, <laughs> they'll probably know it. But yes, those who. Yes. yes. Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, do you think we've missed any topics that you want to talk about? Maybe a few things to give awareness to a few people? No, I think you've, you've pretty much been the. the you've took us through pulmonology and COVID-19 and viruses, bacteria, vaccines. Yeah, yeah. Then we covered general lung health. And then uh, we, you asked me about my journey into medicine, how that was. And uh, I got time to share a few personal anecdotes. And um, I should be putting that question to you as a um, uh, young school student. Do you think anything more what, uh, I mean, what I could have missed out Yes, I will sum, sum it up in the end, but you feel like something else, uh, what your friends would be interested in, in terms of pulmonology, anything else? No, I think uh, because think you've, you've, covered yeah, we've co you've covered a huge uh, prospect of it, especially about kids trying to get into it, uh, we've chick ticked all the boxes. One, one thing, one thing which I'll just, I'll probably sum it up. One thing was many parents and kids ask me, hmm. like... Um, should I take an inhaler? Is it safe to take an inhaler? Is it okay to take a spray inhaler? Yeah. So I'll answer that. So the medicine and inhaler is completely safe. You will be asked to take it only when you actually require it. And it's not addictive. 
so that is one thing which i should have probably answered during that allergy part mm. because many kids you will be seeing a pediatrician or a doctor and they'll be giving you an inhaler the moment you see that you'll be like oh is it addictive no absolutely not you are going to require it you are going to take it when you require it when you don't you're not going to it's absolute and the newer medicines which have come in they are in the form which actually are not addictive which like now you take them the more you uh, the further you take them you actually are going to require it less and uh, along with other uh, steps to um, uh, cure your allergy you are going to require it much less mm. and the inhaler medicine doesn't go anywhere near your internal system it doesn't enter your blood it doesn't even go to the lungs it's just for the airways so this is for your friends and the parents of friends who are scared that yeah. a doctor a pediatrician or a physician or pulmonologist gives them an inhaler inhaler is non addictive mm. inhaler is safe it gives medicine only where it is required and only if required you will be prescribed it no one is going right. to prescribe yeah, it just yeah. like that and not that you start it once you are going to take it lifelong just maybe for a few weeks now and then during the seasons and that's it so this was one thing i uh, would have tried to end, end up uh, end up with uh, maybe asking you what will you say to the aspiring uh, doctors but i think we completed uh, yeah i it. think we covered yes. that i i would encourage aspiring doctors if you have i had mentioned what it uh, what all it takes and you have those qualities i would strongly urge you to take up medicine but yes you you may not be like you would have seen doctors you may be in a different way you may be in a different place you may be but there is space for you and actually we need youngsters more uh, more, more and more youngsters like you so i would uh, ask all my aspiring doctors to just uh, i mean just fully dedicate yourself to preparing for it and uh, there's a very good future waiting for all of you do you think so, uh, in the field of uh, becoming a doctor um let's say i'm not very good uh, in terms of memory mm-hmm. but uh, there are kids who are who are not that good in memory but they're able to problem solve right and as you said um the field of medicine is very creative it's yes, also yes, yes, an yes, art yes, as yes. well as it's clinical um so do you think uh, children who don't have the best men, uh, memory can still get into the field of they can still get into medicine they can crack it in two ways one is there are these memory hacks or mnemonics what we use Hmm. and uh, that can be used when you're preparing and when you have to clear your exams and all that and those kids actually they end up reading the concepts better yeah so maybe for exams due to lack of time they clear their exams with mnemonics hmm. but later on because they've read the concepts well they can actually uh, remember the basic concept well and that uh, helps them really in the long term because once the basic concept is good as i said the names of medicines keep changing the doses keep changing and there are various apps there are various ways in which you can look it up and uh, sometimes uh, there is something called active mugging up or active memory sometimes you don't realize it but when you're doing it day in and day out it actually gets into you mm. so kids who are like uh, concerned about that they need not worry at all yes you do need to kind of have some kind of basic memory which i'm sure many most students have yeah. it's not at all a concern you can train your brain very well so you tell you're talking about lungs that's how you train your brain as well that's another organ so it can be trained well and you can take care of it no wow, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving your time especially as a doctor uh, over here thank and you, thank um, you. i mean you you uh, strive in trying to help uh, patients from tier 2 and tier 3 uh, cities and towns um but with this video i think we'll be able to reach a much broader spe- uh, spectrum as to what you should look um uh, for what you should uh, what are the preventive uh, steps to take so uh, thank you doctor thank you for thank you time. thank you for giving me this yes. opportunity namaskar and uh, that uh, should be after covid it's like should we shake hands or <laughs> just namaste it's safe only we can yes. shake hands thank you COVID thank you doctor namaskar. thank you and namaste and i'm uh, i hope it has helped uh, many people yes. what we had discussion thank you thank, thank you. you doctor thank you thank you